started. Welcome to uh, our session on the freelance life. Um, would you like to introduce? Yes, I am Toya Kristen Finley of Shinho Media. And I'm CJ Kirshner of Polyhedron Productions. Toya, do you want to talk about uh, what Shinho Media is and what you've done? So I am basically a freelancer for my entire adult life. Um, I am a game designer, a narrator designer, a game writer, and an editor in games. And in general, I am a writer and an editor, so I will work in different storytelling media. Um, I've published just as prose fiction over like 60 something stories and probably 70 pieces all together in different media. And I am on the IGDA Game Writing Special Interest Group Executive Board. And I have done a couple of books. I co-authored The Game Narrative Toolbox, which is about narrative design um, and implementing into games and working with a team. And I was also the editor and contributor to Narrative Tactics for Mobile and Social Games. And if I may say so, it is the only book that you can find that is dedicated to narrative and writing for mobile and social games. Um, so, I previously worked at a variety of mainstream AAA studios like THQ, Ubisoft. Uh, I broke off in 2015 to start my own studio called Polyhedron Productions. We are split between doing narrative consulting and internal development. Um, so as narrative consultants, we are freelance and we continue to work with uh, both mainstream uh, studios like Ubisoft, Techland, uh, Deep Silver, but also with independent pr uh, productions like um, there's a company in Denmark called Throughline Games. They made a beautiful, beautiful animated 2D game called Forgotten Hand. Um, just recently worked on a game called Unheard, which came out a few weeks ago. Audio detective adventure, lots of fun. So it, it's, it provides a really, really good opportunity to mix things up. We'll definitely talk about that. Uh, as this goes on. So, I guess the, the question is, why go freelance? Well, I, I think one thing that's going to be very important to keep in mind is that the freelance business is individual and unique to you, and you're going to hear our differences. Um, not that we disagree, but we have differences in the way that we do things and the why of what we do. And for me, being a freelancer fits my personality and my lifestyle. As I said, I've done it my entire adult life. I wasn't intentionally trying to go freelance. But I am an outdoor cat who sometimes plays nicely with indoor cats. So um, I like to work on a lot of different things. If I were sedentary and you know, working at the same studio on the same project for four years, I'd probably get extremely bored. As I mentioned, I work in different media. I am not exclusive to games. If I just worked on games all the time, I'd probably get really bored. I like working on my own stuff. And so I need to have the emotional and physical energy to be able to do that. So I, if, I'm in, if I'm employed, um, I probably don't have the ability to work on my own stuff and, and have like the physical and emotional freedom to do that. I also have a schedule that is like a non-undead vampire. I wake up at 1 or 2 p.m. I go to bed around 6 or 7 a.m. I can't do that if I'm employed, most likely, so that's why I'm a freelancer. I knew there was a reason I was protecting my jugular all this time. Um, I, I worked in the large studios, and I got a very good sense of, of how they operated and what they needed, and uh, uh, I was seeking variety and generality when they were asking for specificity and uh, not loyalty in a negative sense, but when you are on a, a project or perhaps a particular brand, you are generally attached to that for quite some time, and I wanted to diversify and explore different areas. and. This has provided me an excellent opportunity to do that. I also am seeing games grow significantly in terms of the amount of writing that they require 
And much of that can be done by in-house staff writers, but there is, is also quite a bit of room for freelancers, and they're often called in. And uh, one of the, the things that I like to describe it as is narrative paramedics or uh, paratroopers with pens. Um, but the calling in doesn't necessarily have to be actually parachuting into it. I wish it were. Goodness gracious, do I. Um, but it, 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 it's also a metaphor for uh, being called into a client and to collaborating on a project. Um, so, where do we go from here? Oh, right. Let's break down how the rest of this is going to go because I've got this one slide about. Um, these are just the bits and pieces that we're going to discuss the freelance mentality about making the foundation, about how you find work and establish rates, about marketing, and then what telecommuting. And if there's time, we'll do the wrap up and takeaways and the QA, and then we'll thank all of you again for coming because this is fun. So, freelance mentality. So, first and most and foremost, you are not an employee. And this is something that I keep hammering. And in fact, I gave a talk on freelancing one time, and somebody in their feedback was really annoyed with me. And they're like, of course I know that I'm not an employee. Um, but I have seen freelancers who's been doing this for 10 years refer to their clients as employers, <laughs> which means they don't have the freelance mentality. You are your own boss. You do not have employers. You have clients. When you work with a client, you are in a collaborative relationship with them. You are on equal footing with them. You come to agreements about what you're doing, when your schedule is, how much you are paid. They're not dictating to you. You're not dictating with them. Again, it is a collaboration. So the first thing is you really, really, really must get into your head that you are your own boss. Because if you don't, you can get stepped on either intentionally or unintentionally, because sometimes you have clients who just don't know any better. They also do not understand that you are a freelancer um, and not an employee. So please, even learning the correct language is very important, um, because if you have the correct language, that's working towards the right mentality. Um, I have my own company now. It's terrifying and it's thrilling. And sometimes my company gets to, as Toya pointed out, uh, collaborate with these other companies. And while I view myself as a service provider, uh, I'm working with them to fill a need that they have on a project that they are building. Primarily, you know, they're putting in most of the, the, the real backbreaking labor. Um, I'm now in charge of my own destiny to a degree. And that, like I said, is terrifying and thrilling. And it's liberating in many regards. Um, yeah? Uh, I, I forgot one very important thing. You can fire your clients. If you are in a bad working relationship, you can get out of it. So again, employees can't fire bosses. <laughs> no, but at the same time, you, know, you also want to try and do everything that you can to not right. get let go yourself. Yes. Keep the customer satisfied, as I like to say. Um, and then variety was the big, the big part of it. Uh, and this is a, just a fun sort of side. Since going freelance, in terms of video game genres, I haven't worked in the same one twice. Uh, so every project that I've done has been different in significant ways, whether it was, like I said, a 2D platformer or a first-person shooter, or I worked on a basketball game. Um, the opportunity to play in all of these different spaces uh, and explore these different topics is what gets me up in the morning. Um, that said, and this was this, yeah, I've got mine and then Toy's got hers. Um, oh, there's music. I forgot there was music. You will be spinning a lot of plates. Um, also, this incredible performance. Can I mute this? Yeah, there we go. Um, so oftentimes I find myself working with multiple clients at the same time. Some, some are mainstream, some are independent. Um, I'm also dealing with my own business aspects and all of my personal life, so it's a lot of, I can't even do the balancing on the ball thing, let's, let's not pretend. Um, but in terms of having to keep track of all of the bits and pieces that you're currently trying to manage and finish and deliver, 
uh, it can it can be very similar to that. Um, your way of putting it was also very good. Yeah, uh, you're a multiple hat wearer. So I've got a really quick question: Is how many people in here are narrative types? So like most of the, like there are people in the room who aren't narrative types at all, right? How many of you are not? Okay, how many of you do something else, like you do art, or programming, or sound? Okay, so there, we already have multiple hat wearers in the room, right? So the cool thing is, as a freelancer, you can do all your hats. So if we have students in here. Have you ever gotten the advice, like, if you go to an indie studio, you're going to be really valuable if you can do more than one thing? The thing about if you were an employee, if you are at that studio, you don't get paid for all the stuff you do separately. If you are a freelancer and say you have one client and you're doing the sound for them and you're also doing the narrative, you should get paid for doing the sound and then you should get paid separately for doing the narrative. And so if you're a multiple hat wearer, use that to your advantage. Um, you can say, hey, do you also need sound on this project? You know, let's, let's negotiate something for that too. But make sure that you wear those hats separately and you get paid for them separately. I can't wear that many hats. So, um, so now we'd like to talk about laying the foundation. Uh, and this is the aspects of, of getting started, setting up a business. We've got the mindset. Now how do we act on it? Um, so um, the first point is to decide your identity. Uh, if you'd like to. So, your brand, basically. Um, and I mentioned that my company is Schnoodle Media. Well, a Schnoodle is a dog. <laughs> it's a Schnauzer Poodle. Um, I love dogs. You might be able to figure that out. <laughs> um, I wear this hoodie all the time. I have dogs. I had a Schnoodle. I had a Schnauzer Poodle, I got her when I was 13. She died when I was 29. So she was alive for more than half of my life at that time. She was a big part of my life. Um, I, when she died, uh, she had been alive for more than half of my life. Um, the other thing is, she's a mixed breed, right? She's a Schnauzer, she's a Poodle. Um, I do a lot of different genre stuff. I work in different genres. I work in different media. So I came up with the, the tagline, entertainment of mixed breeding. So the schnoodle is something that's very important to me. It's part of my personal identity. It's part of what I do. Um, so that's part of my branding. I work in multiple media. I work with writing different genres. I picked polyhedron because I like math puns, uh, and that lent itself really well to them. Uh, we've got many faces, and we're always trying to figure out what our angle is. Um, and it was uh, just a, it has tie-ins to a project that we're working on that we haven't fully discussed yet. But um, the core thing is to find something that is identifiable and unique and personal. Um, it can be your name, or it can be a separate company name, but it should be something that when you are seeking work, somebody can associate with you. Um, and it's good to search around on the internet and uh, LinkedIn uh, websites, your state's business lookup to find out whether or not there's anything similar to it out there. Uh, funny story, there is another Polyhedron Productions that contacted me on LinkedIn. Uh, he's a birthday clown in Colorado. <laughs> Wishing I had a nose to put on, that I should have brought one. Um, so this this is uh, this was my first thing that I did after I figured out what I was going to call the company, and I made a plan. Uh, I wrote up uh, the business intentions for what I wanted to achieve, and the types of games and, and studios that I wanted to work with, and where I wanted to be at the end of the first year, and then at the end of the second year, and how that would progress to the fifth and tenth year. And it's something that I come back to at the end of every year and update with, 
here's what we managed to get done. Here's the successes. Here are the areas to work on. Um, you don't have to do this. This may be a, a level of, of um, I don't know what the word is, organization. It's not organization preparedness, or, or but it may be, it may be life too, too, yeah, life and business goals, too, too strict uh, for your taste. Again, it's based on what you want. Um, but it's, for me, it's been a really useful resource to come back to and go, okay, hey, listen, we're at the end of year five, and uh, we're nowhere near where we thought we were going to be, so we'll push those out to year seven, and we will try next year to achieve part of those. And it's just nice to have a, a road map um, versus the sort of lost wandering in the wilderness. Though I do enjoy getting lost in the wilderness too, so. Yeah, I was not nearly as structured as all of that. I probably should have been. Um, I just jumped into doing games because I really wanted to. Um, but if you're not as good and structured and organized as you were, uh, there are nonprofits that help people set up their small business plans. Um, and so they can help you set up your roadmap, you know, what your business is going to be about, how it's structured, uh, what type of entity it should be, which we'll get into in a little bit. It's also nice to have an assets list so you know roughly what you've got, what gets used for your business. Um, if you need to upgrade or replace anything, um, you've got records of, of what that is and where you got it from and how much you should expect to spend on it. Um, Setting up a web presence. So this is uh, locking down a potential URL for the name and identity that you decided on. Um, and I did want to talk about a little bit how the issue of like cyber stalking and bullying, uh, because not everybody is as safe on the web as they should be. Um, and you know, if you belong to certain groups, you are a target. I, the nice thing about certain uh, website platforms like Wix, I use Wix for my website, is that you can add a contact form. And somebody just fills in their information and types up the message. They never see your email address. Uh, so you can put as little or as much information as possible, like your contact information. But you really do want to have a web presence, whether that's like LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Places where people can find you. So I have a friend who is an editor. This wasn't a games project, but she wanted to invite writers to the project. And she was frustrated because she couldn't find any information in how to get in contact with them. So do have something because once people know that you're out there and they're interested in you, they are going to look you up. Um, and they're, they're going to try to get in contact with you for, your, for projects. And even if you don't, I mean, you can build a very simple website that is the sort of anonymous contact form, even if it just says coming soon. If somebody wants to find you, they punch in, you know, www.yournamehere.com, and they see, okay, there is something and it will be coming. It's better than if they get the, uh, the cannot find page page. Um, so having a, a, a temporary initial web presence is probably a really good idea, as are getting business cards, um, especially when you are attending events like ECGC or GDC or just trying to get your name out there. <coughs> to be able to hand someone a card and to get their card in return, it's a very strange and subtle uh, businessy handshake, but um, go and find a place to get business cards printed relatively inexpensively and relatively quickly and again like having the website gives you a, a chance to get your name out there. Uh, so I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Uh, just kind of honestly answer this for yourselves. How many of you are aspiring to be something right now? Oh you, oh, you are raising your hands. You don't have to. Okay. <laughs> How many of you are beginners? Beginners at what we're aspiring to be? Uh, uh, aspiring, beginning, novices, that sort of thing. We also need to get rid of that mentality. Because if you're actually doing it, it doesn't matter if, if you're getting paid for it or not. You're doing the thing. 
And one thing that I try to get people to understand is not to see yourself as a beginner or aspiring or a novice. Because if I'm a client, I don't want somebody who sees themselves as a beginner. I want somebody who shows that they're confident in what they're doing already. Because if I'm paying you to do work for me, I'm investing in you and your talent. So I'm going to go for somebody who does not have beginner or aspiring or novice or some other marker like that on their cards. And I'm bringing that up because I have seen people with words to that effect on their cards. In fact, after I gave a talk at ECGC one year on freelancing, somebody came up to me and he had like aspiring and novice on his cards. <laughs> do, do not do that. Um, you're doing the thing. If you're a game designer, you're a game designer. You're not an aspiring game designer. You're already doing the work in game design, even if you are a student. So that's just shooting yourself in the foot, really. Uh, have confidence, know what you know, um, and, and present yourself as an expert in what you're doing. Wonderfully put, actually. I was gonna say, uh, there are lots of things. We're all always learning, but you want to project that you're doing it. Um, you also want to, as part of setting up your business, look into recruiting allies, and that sounds uh, a bit militaristic, but in this case, it's uh, people like tax assistants or tax preparers, uh, attorneys, people to help you negotiate your contracts or to help you figure out your finances. And Toya, you were telling me earlier about uh, the service that you use. Yes. Uh, I won't get into it too much because I'd start shilling. I'm actually an associate for it. But if you are interested in learning more, we can talk about it um, afterwards. It's a service called Legal Shield, which is a subscription that you pay monthly and that you can get legal advice on basically anything that you need. And if you think about how much lawyers cost, one time I had a question about patents and my local state office did not have a patent expert, so they got me in contact with somebody in South Carolina, and I talked to him for like 30 minutes. So you think about that, that was like pennies on the dollar, and if you know how much patent attorneys cost, you'll see the value in that. Um, but it's good to have legal representation because you're going to need to understand contracts. Um, you're going to need to have somebody look at contracts you receive, if you have like your own contract, you want to make sure that it's legally sound. Uh, or if you decide later on you want to register your business name as a trademark, that is something that they can help you with. There are a variety of services, Legal Shield, I know there's Legal Zoom as well, I haven't used either. In my case, I have a, a dedicated attorney, um, and I'm very, very pleased with all of the help they've provided me thus far. It does cost a bit more, but again, I've got a really good relationship with them, and I don't, like, I know that they're looking out for my best interest. Um, there are a number of video game lawyers that are here at ECGC, so if this is something that you are interested in finding out more about, um, they are giving talks, you'll see them wandering around, reach out to them, talk to them. I don't think that they'll charge you for the first, uh, First conversation. Um, First it is free. <laughs> is that why I keep getting in? Um, and then the other thing uh, we recommend is setting up a professional bank account. So separate from your personal one. Um, the reason for this is, one, it keeps your finances protected. Two, it gives you a place that when you get your first client paycheck, you can deposit it into your business's bank account. And also because sometimes uh, your clients will be not in the same country that you are in and you may need to do a wire transfer and there are mechanisms to get yourself paid um, by them. Yeah, I, I do have a separate account. I don't use it as much as I should probably. Um, but like CJ was saying, it is a separate entity from your personal stuff. And one reason why that's very helpful is say, God forbid you got sued. And so the first thing that the person who's suing you, their lawyer is going to look you up and try to find your, all of your assets and see how much money you have. Um, and so if your business is a separate entity from you, they are not going to go after your business assets. 
The other thing I recommend is make sure that you have savings because freelance is often described as feast and famine and that you will work for a concentrated period of time and then not work for an extended period of time. Now that's not always the case, but again, given that you are generally searching and then when you're not searching, you're, you're head down nose to the grindstone, um, you need to make sure that you can still cover your general life expenses while that's happening. So speaking of that, let's talk about finding work and setting rates. Um, so the first thing is, um, are there events in your area? Are there professional uh, gaming groups in your area? Um, you can start networking there, get to know people, um, even suggest giving talks because you want to show that you're an expert in your area um, and people get to know about how you see your work, how you would see your role and responsibility on a particular project. So you want to become a known and valued asset for what you do in your own local area. And if you're in an area like Raleigh or Durham, or carry. Um, there are a number of prominent game studios here that you might approach for either full employment or for freelance employment. Um, and it's good to have a list and to know what's around you. Um, find out whether or not there's an IGDA chapter in your neighborhood. And if you're not a member, you can generally go at least to the first meeting uh, as, a, as a non member and just meet people. Um, got fire going on in the background here. Um, and these are good sources of finding friends and comrades and advice and again potential clients down the road. Um, it's worth noting that some of these events may be 21 or older because they're often held at bars, um, but they're not always. You know, if, if that if age is a, is a restriction, then hopefully there will also be some that you are able to attend. Um, you can also look online, and this is, this is an area that you are much more on. So, finding work can be kind of difficult, right? Especially if you're not known yet. So, uh, I was mentioning local groups, but one way you can find local groups is going to like meetup.com and finding, looking for things in your area. Um, one way to make sure that you get in front of all of your competitors is go to like Kickstarter look up the different uh, Kickstarter campaigns, uh, find games that you are interested in, uh, find ones that are like close to either, you know, making their goal, reaching their goals or they've already got them, and say, hey, uh, do you need any writing help? And if they agree to that, what they can do is just add a stretch goal so that, you know, if they make that stretch goal, you're going to get paid. If they don't make the stretch goal, then no big deal. You already reached out to them. The other thing is look for online groups like um, Unreal, Unity, Godot, different engines, um, different indie uh, game dev groups, because they're usually going to have discussion forums, and one area is going to be you know, for jobs, and they're probably going to have freelance threads. So these are going to be devs who are very actively seeking freelancers. Events that worked, that did work. Um, you're already at an event, so that's great. Uh, there's also, you know, at events like GDC, which are much, much larger, much more dense, require a bit more of your time and personal investment. Uh, and if you are looking to do networking there, it has uh, become so hectic for many of the other attendees that often they want those meetings set up weeks, if not months, beforehand. But again, if you want access to almost every, well not almost everyone, but a lot of very prominent industry individuals, um, that's, a, that's a good one to go to. But again, your local IGDA chapter meetings may be a good one to go to. Uh, this is a great one to go to. Oh, all right. Um, this is all you. So here's another really important thing to think about. I mentioned, I, I don't just work in games, right? And I think sometimes, people feel like, well, I'm trying to get into games, so I should just look for work in games. No, you have skills that are transferable to other industries. 
And so it's important to look for work in other fields, too. If you're an artist, do art for an app. Do art for somebody who's doing a children's book or, you know, they need illustrations for something. Um, do sound for other things. Uh, my most steady recurring job is uh, uh, copy editing courses online. It's, that's not games, but it brings in money. And the important thing to keep in mind is when you work on things that aren't games, you are polishing skills and honing skills that you're going to be able to apply to your games work as well. So don't have blinders on and think, I've just got to look at games. You have lots of opportunities that are open to you. And at the same time, when you're learning how to negotiate with clients and you're getting work in other fields, um, you're figuring out your life as a freelancer and how well you work and what your rate should be. And you can bring that back when you're looking at games. My piece was cold call potential partners. And this, this again, is a, an experience that I was very fortunate to have. There was a company that made uh, their first game, released it online, and it was ambitious, if a bit underpolished. And so I found their general email address, and I reached out to them and said, I really admire what you did, and I'd love to work with you if the opportunity arose in the future. And they were open to the possibility to the suggestion and after some negotiations we got an agreement in place and I started working with them and it turned out that I then got to write a delightful 90s style point and click adventure game that's set in the Saudi Arabian desert. Um, hopefully it will come out this summer but it was a fascinating journey from I saw what you did and I liked what you did to learning about this different culture, this different part of the world, and re-experiencing from a different perspective, not no longer as a player, but now as a, as a creator, the joy that I remember when I was a kid growing up playing The Adventures of Monkey Island and, and Grim Fandango. Um, so reach out, ask if they're looking for help, and if you can offer it, maybe they'll take it. So one of the, the big questions that people have when they're getting into freelancing, and even freelancers themselves, are always struggling with, how much should I be paid for what I'm doing? Um, so I actually wrote kind of a primer for the game writing sig about um, figuring out how much you should ask, and that's going to be dictated by a couple of things, your experience level, um, education-wise, and profession-wise. So for example, if you've already been writing in other fields, but you haven't worked in games before, you still have a lot of experience in storytelling. So you can command a higher rate than somebody who maybe has um, a game design degree and has been learning about storytelling but hasn't already been doing it professionally. So there's going to be a scale, uh, like there's going to be a lower end for professional rates and a higher end. So based upon your education and level of experience, um, you're either going to go with the lower end if you don't have as much experience, and you're going to go with the higher end if you do. And in, the, um, in this particular article, you'll see that I have several sources that you can look up. Um, one is from the Editorial Freelancers Association, and so they tell you what your hourly rate should be um, for writing. There's a PDF called How Much Should I Charge, which was actually a survey um, of different writers and what their rates were, uh, flat rate as well as hourly. And then the Writers Guild of Great Britain actually did a survey and then um, explained what uh, professional freelance game writers should be making. And as far as I know, they're the only professional organization that specifically talks about games writing. So what you have to do is, a lot of times, look at adjacent industries again because there aren't standards in games. And so look at things like how much do ghostwriters make? How much do copywriters make? How, do you, how much should you make for writing a screenplay? Because you're doing similar things in games. And I will just add that regardless, your work, you deserve to be compensated, especially if you're providing that service for uh, a studio. Um, and if you 
feel like you want to try and ask for more, it doesn't hurt to ask. The worst they can say is no. And, and usually, if you throw out an amount and they agree immediately, you have not asked for enough. <laughs> so you do want you do want to negotiate a little bit. Additionally, as part of these negotiations, you want to establish your contract. And uh, this is, again, something that I'd recommend that you do with some legal help. But figuring out how to come together on mutually respectful terms, um, how to make sure that you are properly credited to establish what your, what your payment dates and terms and milestones for deliverables are going to be, um, all of these things can be housed in a very long, very legalese, um, but also super crucial document that you and your client establish at the outset. So CJ mentioned milestones, and milestones are basically dates for when things are due. So you'll have dates in your contract that say, I am going to deliver you know, this documentation to the client. But also you want to keep in mind that your client is responsible for things too. So your client should be giving you feedback um, because how are you going to do your job if you don't get really good feedback? And you don't want all of that feedback like at the end of your work. You want to be getting it as you're doing the work. So have milestones for client feedback. Also, uh, have in your contract how you will be credited. It's a real struggle sometimes for games writers to actually get their credit into the game. So you want to say, this is what my name is going to be in the credits, this is the role that I have. Make sure that you have that in there. Also, have in your contract how you will be paid, right? Um, um, and, and have who you are going to send your invoices to, because that might sound really obvious, <laughs> but it took me a year and a half one time to get paid because this was very early on in, in my games career. Neither I nor the producer thought to ask that question, and the producer was not used to paying people. And so there was a lot of bureaucracy involved. And finally, a year and a half later, we found out it was simple as actually sending an invoice to the person who actually paid people. So, um, just moving on quickly, because I think we're stretch of time. Uh, we're going to talk about self-marketing. Um, and the good news is, if you follow this plan so far, you got business cards, and that's a good start. Um, but we've also got the idea of accepting, or adopting, rather, a professional attitude. And if you want to talk about Yeah. Uh, don't talk about your passion. Uh, a lot of people, I think, feel like they need to express how passionate they are about getting into the industry or about games. Everybody has passion. Nobody cares about your passion. They care about, can you do the work? Are you the right person for the project? Uh, so when you're having conversations with people, have conversations about you know, um, what you do, um, you know, your experience, your background. Talk about things that aren't games. You know, you're a well-rounded human being. Let them get to experience who you are as a person, too. The advice that I always give, especially to students and people entering the job market, uh, it's a bit out of date, but Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People is a fantastic book. The title sounds a little mercenary, and it sounds a little manipulative, but truthfully, the advice that it gives, which is to be polite, professional, friendly, be genuinely interested in the interests of others, um, and to find those ways to help one another, uh, don't seem particularly uh, sinister in terms of winning friends and influencing people. Um, and again, it's just, again, adopting that professional, I am, I am talking with someone with whom I hope to work. While, yeah, you do want to give them the well-rounded stuff, you don't want to be rude or impolite or, unless you've got a good rapport with them already, don't curse in front of them. <laughs> yeah, and also, uh, you do want to have a portfolio online. Having said that, uh, plagiarism is a thing. Um, we have a mutual friend who had her own work submitted to her when she was looking to hire people. Um, one way you can try to stop that is to make sure everything is in a PDF. Um, that's not a complete fail-safe because if people are desperate they will find a way to copy your work anyway. Um, but you do at least want to have some sort of link, or um, if you actually have work in games, 
Um, can you find people who have videos, maybe Let's Players? Um, if that's not the case, then play the game yourself. So now you have videos that you can show people. Yeah, the YouTube clips are have been hugely beneficial to me in terms of, I no longer have to submit five page writing samples that I wonder whether or not somebody is going to read. I can give them a 45 second clip of, of a game that has a line I like or a piece of a marketing asset that I wrote, and that communicates, one, the style and tone and language that I, you know, typically adopt, and also that the things that I've worked on have gotten made and put out there, which is, is just useful to know. Um, the other thing we like to do is volunteer our time. Um, so this was, actually, I was going to say, do you want to? Okay. Um, if you find the IGDA chapter, offer to give a talk. If you have a local high school or college, offer to speak to them as well. Offer to work with their students. Um, I was uh, very, very lucky in that I got to give a presentation at the local library to an all-ages group, and it was fun and well-attended, and it led to more requests for speaking engagements, some of which were, in fact, paid. Um, so putting yourself out there and sharing your knowledge and, again, helping others is a good way to help yourself. So, <laughs> I have this thing where I like to uh, collect ribbons, and GDC is a great place to collect ribbons. And um, a couple of years ago, a friend of mine um, had ribbons made up for their own marketing and branding. So I said, you know what, I'm going to do that myself. And so I love collecting ribbons, and I made ribbons myself. And as you can see, that's my long trail of ribbons from this GDC just a couple of months ago. Um, and the two that I got were Shnufu, and then I made up this equation with emoji, and both have my URL on them. And so people were like, oh, those are really cool ribbons. Where did, where did you get them? And I would say, well, would, would you like a ribbon? And you know, sometimes they would pick one, and sometimes they're like, well, I, I cannot decide. And I said, you can have them both. And so I, I became known as Ribbon Lady, and you know, people would see my ribbons walking around, I would have my friends tell me they would see them. Um, people were getting pictures taken with them, so I have my ribbons and pictures now. And I also want to point out, if you see my badge there on the right hand side, my right hand side with the really long trail, at the very top you see a frog, and you see a green clip with a frog. That is the marketing from another speaker here, Rachel Presser, of Sonic Toad. So she's getting free marketing in this talk right now. <laughs> so that's. Oh, <yes. laughs> oh hi! <laughs> I will say I, I didn't before before Toy and I started putting this on together. I never even considered this, and it's so smart. It's visible. It's bright, and you can give them out, which is just good. So there's a, and these are really cheap. Like I, I got a hundred of each for like forty bucks. Um, you know, like Rachel's got the sticker and the clip. You can get buttons. Um, you can get stickers, decals, pens. You know, you can do just about anything. T-shirts, hoodies. Uh, Jeff Howard and uh, Steve Graham are wearing the um, Arcana stuff. So there's lots of things you can do. T-shirts. Um, so there's the idea of the after parties as well. Uh, and hopefully, again, if you're old enough or you have the access, you can come and attend these. Uh, if you are looking to talk to people in a professional manner, you want to continue this outside of the conference, which means not drinking to excess and not cursing and not insulting others or clients, because you never know when or who might be listening. If that sounds really like surveillancey, but again, even even in the more casual environments, you still want to maintain some of that professional demeanor. You can still have fun, too. Work first, party later. It's the mantra you should have. Uh, so I, I, I mentioned that I'm a telecommuter. Um, so all of my work in games has been telecommuting. Um, I am, my office space is actually in my room. And one of the things that we're going to talk about is like separate spaces, but you should have, for me, it's a separate mental space. Uh, so I need background noise. For me, 
that is the television, because I need to hear people talking. If I listen to music, I can't do music. It makes me daydream. <laughs> so it, it's, it's understanding what you can do, but um, when you are a telecommuter, and CJ will talk about this a little bit too, you really need to have good internet service. Um, you're going to be sending a lot of documents. Uh, you might be having teleconferences. Um, but if there are also prospective clients in the room, I would really urge you to consider hiring telecommuters. Uh, Ten years ago when I was trying to get into the industry, I was told you need to move to a hub. And I didn't want to do that. And now I have people coming to me and asking, how do you telecommute? We have lots of virtual studios now because you know it's expensive to rent office spaces. Um, there are some studios where they have employees and then they have freelance telecommuters who are all across the globe. But telecommuting is important, especially for marginalized people who can't just get up and move somewhere and try to get into games. Um, you know, people who have disabilities and cannot move. Um, you know, it, there's a whole wide world of talent out there, and if you are hiring telecommuters, you have a lot more access to extremely creative people who could be working in games if you would give them that opportunity. I'm the opposite. I do have a separate office space, um, and it's beneficial for me because it's a it's a physical mental separation. I go there in the morning at you know around nine, and I leave there around four thirty-five to go home and walk the dog. And sometimes I'll have to go back after dinner, but. When I'm there, I'm in the work mentality, and when I'm home, I know I'm at home, and that's, that's very useful. Um, let's talk about self-care. Yeah, so one thing that you do want to do if you are physically able, get up away from your screen, whether that is a laptop or a monitor, like every 20 or minutes or so. Um, that's not just good for you physically, but it also gets you fresh perspective. You're, not, you're f refreshing your brain. Um, uh, have a good chair, have a good ergonomic chair, um, because if you don't, you can hurt your neck and shoulders. Um, have a good desk. I recently invested in a new desk after having one for 10 years, and I thought well, I was going to have to uh, take apart my old desk. It turned out that uh, some very important screws had already fallen out of it, and the top came right off of it. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, keep your office space up to date. The other thing that I do is once a week I go down to my favorite pizza place. Um, they know me, I have a booth that I like sitting in, I can sit there for like eight hours and just get stuff done. And so I know when I leave my usual space, I am really going to hone in, I've got to get this work done in this eight hours. And also, tip if you're going to do that, tip very well. They say that standing desks are supposed to be a healthier alternative, and they can be. Just don't forget to sit down for six hours, because, oh boy. <laughs> um, client calls, yes. Toya mentioned this. Uh, I, this is especially true for me. I work with a lot of clients remotely, and there are often Skype conferences, and making sure that you've got solid internet, a quiet workspace, a good headset, uh, is essential to making sure that, that you can communicate with them and that they can communicate with you and that you're both on the same page for getting things done. Um, I recommend you get professional grade antivirus software and backup um, because you will be dealing with your own files for your business. You will be dealing with your clients' files which need to be protected. Uh, being able to offer the reassurance is something that will ease their uh, anxieties as well and flags you as somebody that they are comfortable working with. The other thing is don't generally avoid using pirated software. Uh, it's not professional and it exposes you to other ugly legal bits which we don't want. Um, for laptops and desktops, laptops are great for if you're traveling or if you're working from bed, which is not something that I get to do enough. I have a good laptop, I should try it. Um, there are also clients that will ask you to try their build. You know, they'll send you updated versions of the game for your feedback and assessment. Um, and so make sure that whether you have a laptop or a desktop, it is potentially powerful enough to accommodate that request. Um, this one's mine too, I feel like no. 
Um, and sometimes you will be called on site. Uh, I've been very, very fortunate that uh, many of my clients have brought me over for extended periods to all sorts of parts of the world. Um, and it's good to just know where your passport is, and where your towel is, and to be open to traveling. It can be difficult as well. Uh, I have a dog and a cat that require supervision, and I'm fortunate that my, my gracious mother watches them while I'm out of town for weeks or sometimes months on end. And that's that's something that you'll have to consider is uh, if you've got a family, are they able to function if you are called away for two weeks? Or are you willing to go for two months? Maybe not. And that's something that you can establish. And again, if you've got the plan, maybe that's worth establishing there is setting your limits for when and how far you can go. So I think that brings us to the wrap up and takeaways, which are all of these fine things. But to go through them again. Yes, uh, as a freelancer, you are your own boss, have the right mentality. Take your time, do it right. I really just love that SOS band song, but it's, it's, it's truthfully a, uh, uh, an anthem for me about taking the time to make sure that everything is, is where it should be before I have to readjust all of it. Um, yeah. Uh, have great working relationships with your clients. If they're satisfied, they're repeat customers. Uh, it's a lot easier when there's no competition. <laughs> so establish great uh, relationships with your clients, keep them satisfied. Yes, please do get paid and get credited. Um, get paid for all of the hats that you wear, get paid separately for the hats that you wear. Um, have important information in your contract, like what you're gonna be credited as, your milestones, how you're gonna get paid, all that good stuff. Again, I think it's very useful to know what you're working toward, to have that plan in place, and to be striving to achieve something, not just in your current project, but in your career, in your life. Um, it's ambitious, but you know, when you sit down and try and think about it, suddenly you'll find that you value all sorts of things. I think we can do a, a, a little bit of both this one. Uh, there are lots of ways to make yourself known, um, you know, with your web presences, uh, when you are at uh, conventions or conferences and meeting with devs, um, looking up what people need in discussion forums, going to Kickstarter, finding the campaigns that you like. And just don't make a nuisance of yourself or it's, be professional, be efficient, be, be a good relationship for them, and hopefully they'll be a good one for you as well. So I think that's just about everything. Uh, I don't even know if we have time for Q&A. Uh, we have eight minutes. All right, so we do have some Q&A. In that case, let's take some questions. This Is social media like Twitter and Instagram a good way to get your name out there? Uh, I'm going to have to let you take this one. <laughs> yes, I am not as good at, at it as I should be. Um, but I do have friends who are great at it. Um, Andy Walsh is one person um, who talks a lot about games and threads information about narrative. Um, so again, becoming an expert. Uh, we talked about like uh, giving talks. You could think about it this way, give a mini talk on Twitter about something. Um, become known as that guy who knows that stuff, you know, about what you do, and um, they'll start following you to see what new information that you have. Um, also, hashtags are really important, um, especially with Instagram. With Instagram, you can have as many hashtags as you want. Um, and people who aren't even following you will oftentimes find your content just because of the hashtags on Instagram. Um, hashtags on Twitter are also important. You just can't add as, as many as you would like. I'm the exact opposite. I'll say useful, but not essential. Um, they're tools that you can utilize, but I am not on uh, Twitter or Instagram. I have a Twitter for the studio, and it's where we post internal announcements. Like, Announcements less related to client stuff, some more related to the internal development side of things. Um, 
they can be useful, but they you know they don't have to be the only thing that you use. LinkedIn turns out to be a, a super useful uh, social media tool all of a sudden. So um, if you feel comfortable using it, if you think you can you can leverage it and share something fun or interesting or that will attract attention to you, by all means, go for it. Um, what kinds of writing examples do you find that potential clients like to see most from you, and what do you find that gets you the farthest? So this is going to depend, okay. um, because a lot of times I found I don't know what the client is doing. They just kind of put it out there that they have a project and they're looking for, for writers or narrative designers. And so what I do initially is that I have more general portfolio pieces and I say I can tailor my pieces you know, once I have a better understanding of what you need. Um, but in general, like if you have a portfolio, you want it to be as diverse as possible. So show the range of tones and styles and genres, game genres that you can do. Um, show different documentation, like um, screenplay format, um, barks, dialogue, character bios, things like that, so that you are, show that you're well-rounded. Um, but once you understand what the client needs, and sometimes the client will say straight up, you know, can you send these types of samples? Uh, send your own samples first, and I would do that anyway, whether they ask for them or not, um, because a lot of times people don't do that. So it's kind of putting yourself a step ahead of what other people are doing, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's the, the broadness of the portfolio, so cutscenes, sparks. Uh, I'd actually extend it to, if you have the opportunity, marketing materials. Uh, if you can write a short ad for somebody, uh, it, again, gives you another dimension that a potential client might realize they can use. Um, I know when it comes to making a portfolio website, I have like models, artists, and whatever I have, Oxygen to post networks, but for a writer, right? How would you go making your own portfolio website? So the question was, how would you, as a writer, go about making your own portfolio when artists have options like DeviantArt and uh, ArtStation? There are a lot of, like I mentioned, Wix. There are a lot of platforms where you can get free websites, or um, you know, you can uh, buy your own domain name. Um, if you are not like a graphic artist or not a web developer, Wix will uh, give you templates where you can customize your website yourself. You, you can drag and drop things. You can make your own website. Um, and Wix is not the only one. Uh, one thing that you do want to make, sh make sure that you do is to make sure that your website is well structured. So um, if I'm going to your website, I want things clearly defined. Um, I want you to say this is a cutscene sample. You know, I don't. Want, if you also do other media, I don't want your TV stuff mixed in with your game stuff, uh, because then it's very difficult for me to identify what I'm looking for. So uh, the other thing you can do is look at other people's portfolios, see how they're structured and organized, um, look at the layout, um, have visuals if you if you have like screenshots for games. I like I have book covers. I have screenshots for games. That sort of thing, so people can see that I'm not lying. Um, my stuff is out there. I think the free tools are are definitely the uh, the best option. If push came to shove, you could theoretically host them on Google Docs or Dropbox in a in a collection. Uh, again, not ideal. But it does get them online, and it does give you a way to pass them along to people who are interested in them or who want to potentially read them. Contently.com. Con Contently.com. Mm -hmm. Okay. Free, free portfolio. This is .com or .net. Um, I have a profile up there. Who's super writing? Maybe you can put images and other things up there too. Awesome. Did everybody hear that? Yeah, it's just a your name or your like, studio name dot content name dot com would be the um, URL. So it's just one centralized place. That's where I keep all my Hawaii clips and highlights. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I was wondering what 
an employee, uh, what a uh, client is usually looking for from the uh, narrative design of a specialty project? Um, well, that's going to vary from project to project, and sometimes they're going to know and sometimes they are not. Um, <laughs> uh, people are still arguing about what narrative design is. Uh, sometimes people think that narrative designers are game writers and vice versa. Um, so that's one thing that you might have to do is to help your client understand what your role is going to be. You're going to have to come to an agreement about what you're doing anyway, um, but even if like they have a job description, that might change because uh, you are the expert in what you do, right? Um, and you might find out, oh, actually this is what you need, you know, if, once you look at their brief and understand what their game requirements are. So your client might have ideas which may work or may not work, but it is always up to you and your client to agree upon what you're eventually going to be doing. Uh, I just had a quick question. Uh, how similar is a, a gameplay narrative to a screenplay, like when you're writing out? Is it similar to screenplay? It's interesting because they can be very, very similar and very, very different at the same time. Um, I've always said that the format that the story, the, the script takes depends on the audience. So if you're presenting it to, say, a studio head or an actor in a voiceover booth, you would want it to look generally like a, a Hollywood-style screenplay. That said, if you're giving it to your audio um, engineers or designers, your localization uh, translators, or um, your AI people to integrate, it's going to look like a like an Excel spreadsheet, and it's going to have lots of line tags versus character names. Um, there are, in very very rare cases, some tools that can that can translate across the two formats. Um, oftentimes, however, it is you with Word and Excel copying and pasting lines between the two. Um, but yeah, it depends on it depends on. Uh, who the intended audience is, even even on the same project. Um, no, that is all. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, Actually, uh, that's all the time. We that's have. all the time we have. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. Um, <laughs> hope this is interesting, useful, educational. Hope you go out and find your own voice and clients and and get paid while you are doing it. Get paid Woo! and enjoy lunch. <laughs>